Hey, thanks for checking out Lamb Goat's Van Flip podcast. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode. We also want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thanks for supporting us, guys. You guys rock. Welcome to the Van Flip podcast. This is a very special podcast we got going on here. I'm not only joined by Alex once again, but we have Will Putney on the episode today. So welcome, Will. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to uh, chat, go over what I've been working on this week. So I appreciate it. Yeah, you got some things in the works, and you had some works come out uh, this past week. You and the boys in End released your second uh, full length, correct? Yeah, yeah, it just came out um, Friday, and uh, very excited. We've been sitting on that for over a year, um, and uh, it feels good that it's finally out there. People seem to like it, so that's cool. Can't complain about that. And for anyone living under a complete rock, doesn't know who this guy is, uh he i guess around the same time you started um uh, shortly before you started uh fit for an autopsy your production and engineering career started so those two sort of uh coexisted and launched around the same time uh so he's the mastermind of fit for an autopsy and he's a prolific producer and engineer at this point and now he's well not now but and he's also got uh end with uh, Brendan Murphy of Counterparts and Assorted Characters, which has been doing quite well, it seems, from my perspective. This In past, any case, sorry. Yep, that past That's record cool. we were just talking about is very, very good. I will. I have to tip my hat to you on that, and the boys will. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think um, we took it serious this time. I think the EP was more of a, um, you know, let's do this thing for fun. We all want to make music like this, and let's see if people like it whatever you know a passion project thing like at its core and um we noticed people were into it so we all made a collective effort to try harder do a proper record put the work in at this time and yeah it felt good it was really uh creatively satisfying i think for everybody in the band and uh yeah like i'm i'm just happy that we we have it out now because it's been a while it's been a long time coming with that one i'm curious uh i think your first uh, EP was put out with Good Fight, right? Am I crazy? Yeah, and... we did it 2017. I think we did an EP with Carl. Okay. And Why closed casket? Uh, it almost seems like you guys were. Uh, I, I mean, Justin and company know what they're doing. Um, so I'm not diminishing them in any way. It just, it kind of surprised me. I, it almost seemed like End was destined for a bigger label. Uh, can you sort of explain how you ended up where you did at not pure noise or, um, you know, nuclear blast or wherever? Sure. I mean, we, we had some conversations, but, um, I've known Justin for a while. He's actually a very close friend and, uh, I've worked and produced a lot of records for his label and I've like watched, he's a one man team and I've watched how insanely good he is at like, breaking bands in this world and that's not to diminish carl at all because i mean jesus carl did ferret i mean he was probably the probably the model for justin's label to begin with you know um but uh i knew i knew like the the just one-on-one connection that i had with him was gonna work really well for end and i don't have any interest in really taking the band to a bigger label per se i mean justin sells just as many records as some of these bigger labels you know with you know a smarter approach to it and like a more economical way of doing a lot of things in house and i just like i felt like we would do something special together and uh i knew he really liked the band too and actually with carl we, he still was involved in the record like he you know he's got his own color and like carl's just like, another guy that i've you know known for a long time and he was cool letting us do it there i think he understood like he didn't want to really dump the amount of work i was talking about for this record you know into it and justin was like all bored and excited to do it um so it was like a mutual across the board everybody's friends we all work together we do a million projects you know together on both on both sides and um it it just worked itself out really easy you know so i love both of them i think they both do killer jobs with their bands and um i just like working with different people you know so it was good it was it was a fun way to do it that makes sense so when you're uh sitting with your guitar somewhere and you come up with that amazing riff uh 
how do you decide if it's end or fit for an autopsy <laughs> or a co-writing credit on the next body count album i think uh i think um the two bands have a pretty defined identity now i think if you would have asked me that five years ago i would be like I don't, I don't know i think it's all the same band in my head i wanted to i i kind of hit this wall writing songs where i was like this doesn't sound like the way i think that fit should be going anymore you know, I see the band growing in the metal world. All the guys in that in my band are like metalhead guys. And I'm listening to these, you know, DB hardcore records, which they like too. My drummer's are very, very big into the grind world and everybody likes that stuff, but nobody really plays that stuff in fit. And I was writing this music and I'm like, Dad, this just isn't the right thing for this band. You know, we we took a, a different angle and a different approach to the music that I really like and I think it works really good for the band. And it, I wanted to play the strengths of the guys that were in that band. So I just had this pile of stuff that didn't fit anymore. And I was like, I really want to do this. What's, you know, I really would love this to be a band. And then I realized Brendan had the same. Brendan was in the kind of a similar place. He had darker lyrical concepts and things he wanted to go get out. And I knew he loved that style of music, too. And, you know, Counterparts was going a different direction. I wouldn't say they're getting lighter, but they're more, a very melodic band and there's not a lot of place for some of this crazy stuff in that music, you know? So we were like, let's just do this thing. We get it out of our system. And then our bands are, all of our bands are more focused, you know? And I think it made, all, I think it made Counterparts better. I think it made Fit better. I think it makes M better. It was like, this just a really productive thing for us to do. That makes perfect sense. It is, uh, your drummer for uh, Ed is Reimer, the official drummer there. Yeah, Billy's Billy's in the okay. band. Um, he's awesome. It was like a surreal <laughs> moment. Yeah, we knew he liked we knew he liked the band, and I actually needed somebody as a fill in. Um, we did the EP with Andrew, who played in Structures, and um, Andrew got a really great gig as a sort of like a uh, he's he's like a non retainer drummer for a really big pop artist in Canada. And uh, he was having fun playing arenas, doing crazy stuff. And yeah. it was definitely, it was the type of thing where he'd be free, but then right before the show, he'd get a call and he wouldn't be able to do it anymore. And it, it happened a few times. And I was like, let's get a fill in. I don't want to cancel shows. We barely play shows to begin with. You know, um, I knew Billy liked the band and I just asked him and he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll play for a couple of shows. I was like, you know what? Do you want to just be in this band? Cause you're just the best. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's just how I just took a shot, took my shot and got lucky. Ed Andrew was super cool about it. He's, you know, he's like, well, if anyone's going to do it, I'm glad it's him. That's awesome. Love that guy, too. And, you know, he's got several projects where he's a drumming. And I'm glad we're not in the way of his success with our crusty fucking grind band, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well at least, you know, he's technically capable of playing whatever the heck you come up with. Yeah, that's got to be really comforting. <laughs> I think he pushed us to like go out of the box too. Cause now I'm like, we have this weapon and you know, we don't, we don't, I don't ever want to try to do Dillinger cause that it's only Nobody. Dillinger, yeah. you know, but I was like, wow, we can, I know this guy can do anything. So let's just, yeah. Throw a couple of extra time signature things in, make this part a little weirder stuff got more linear. And it was like, yeah, he just absorbs all of it. And it's, it's really fun to have a guy like that. Yeah, no doubt. He was, also, to, he was also in Glass Jaw. I just want to put that in there. Yeah, the Glass Jaw record, the <laughs> drums are out of control. Never heard of him. Yeah. And he's touring with um, Heart also, which he just loves. It's like a passion thing for him. Did you and, say Heart? Uh, Horror. So oh. H O nine nine oh nine. I got you. Yeah. I, yeah. Is it called Heart? Is it hard? Yeah. He's, call it hard? Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's playing Barracuda every <laughs> night for Heart. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was like, what is that? <laughs> Pat, it, that must be a big passion project then. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, he he was doing like Manson corn tours and things like you know like just ha getting a real cool experience on a big scale with that band, you know, being able to live off playing drums, which is all he, you know, it's what he wants to do. It's so he's creatively fulfilled and he's you know comfortable and yeah, it was like we're part time, so it's great. It all just fell into place, you know, and um, yeah, I'm really just happy with my guys and especially on this record, everybody. Everybody brought the goods, and I think it's reflective of the album now, you know. Yeah, and I Dave's not just uh, blowing smoke. He's 
told me privately a few times, like, man, this end record is solid. You got to go. Because I've told him, like, I don't, I don't listen to a lot of stuff. I mean, I hear it and I listen uh, casually as I post songs or whatever, but actually sitting down with albums and intently concentrating, et cetera, um, that's infrequent for me. So he was trying to encourage me to do that, which I started doing. Um, and yeah, that album's relentless. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, which is we, what you're going for, I'm sure. We had a goal in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy that we amped it up a little on this one. Now we're just wide open for. I'm excited to do it again, honestly. Yeah, I hate but, using I hate using the term mature, but it is very. Uh, it it is, like you said, it more dedicated. It it feels like you guys dedicated more time and effort into it, uh, and you can truly tell on the um, on the record. What were some of the influences that made it different from the previous uh, EPs and full length? I think the grind element came in a lot more. Um, I think me, me and Greg are pretty are pretty heavy into that world and like a lot of these kind of noisier, obscure bands and classic stuff like Napalm Death and Rotten Sound too. And we uh, we were like, that's the most extreme, you know. Like to us, we're like, we want to be an extreme band. Like, what is the wildest stuff? Like. So we jammed a lot of those records and we're like, let's just do more of this. This is the stuff that feels good. And we would write, we would, even when we were writing songs, we'd hit parts where like, yeah, just blast, blast for like a, a minute. It's sick. Like, you know, and we were just having fun with it. And it's just the music we like, you know? So it, it was influenced from all that world. Plus like the artsy hardcore stuff. I'm lucky that the, my shared tastes with Greg, if anyone who doesn't know Greg Thomas, he's being misery signals. He's, got a studio in connecticut silver bullet studios is just like my partner in crime on in end and um he's just i love writing music with him because we just agree about everything you know and um so we just had a ton of fun like digging into the classic records that we liked and trying to do our kind of ode to that stuff and yeah it was just a fun deep dive into that whole world if it's it's definitely um very aligned with the stuff we like Interesting. Are you worried? Uh, I, I wouldn't. I should save that question. It's the record's only been out a handful of days, like four days now. Uh, came out last Friday. What is your take on the reception thus far? I haven't really seen too much negative stuff, except um, people don't like that it sounds too messy or this is like hard to hear. But it, I mean, we like it. it's the intent. A lot of it's intentional, you know. Uh, vocals are low shit's distorted it, it's like kind of a mess on purpose and it's like it's what we wanted so it's like those are if that's all that the negative if, if that's all the negative i'm seeing um then i feel good about it because it's that's just you know that's just your opinion what kind of production style you like or don't and um, maybe you guys should have gone with a professional producer yeah i stuff. think me and greg should have thought about who <laughs> who we should have recorded with next time but you know it's ta it's just taste call stuff and if like if that's the only beef um, that I can find, I feel good about that. You know, and no one's saying the songs stink, you know, so I, uh, I hope it stays like that. It seems to be pretty well received. Um, I, I don't care that much anymore. You know, I learned a, a while ago, if I'm going to be in a band and write music, I think I have to stop caring about what other people think of the music I write. Cause I don't really have to be in a band. I'm like this fortunate you know, blessed position where I get to be in everybody's bands all year and work with dudes and write music and be inspired. And I'm a part of so many records that it's like, why would I do a band if I didn't only just do whatever I wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I think that approach has cleared my head. And I, if I see a comment, you say I suck. It's like, fine. I, if you think I suck, I suck. I, I actually don't care anymore, you know? And, yeah. Well, uh, you're, it, you're it in that great. position yeah um, it's cool it took a long time to get there i definitely have sweated it in the past and um letting go of that stuff and just doing what you want and being a little more free creatively i think just makes better music so i, I definitely recommend trying it you know yeah well as you said fortunately for you uh fit for an autopsy and, and don't pay the bills uh so you don't have to to worry about the the marketplace so to speak uh which brings me to, you know, your whole production engineering career. From what I know, you started out working with 
uh, machine, the machine. Does he call himself the machine or machine? I don't even Just know. Machine. Uh, Just machine. Okay. Took you me started working with. Yeah. <laughs> um, his name's real name's Gene, I think, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Am I crazy? All right. The machine, machine, not the machine. That's where you started. That's you know where you, I suppose, learned your trade in in crash course uh, fashion. And I, I'm trying to think back. The first time I heard a machine, I think, because I was a big VOD Vision of Disorder fan, and you know when when they decided to do From Bliss to Devastation with him, yeah, uh, that was sort of where he got on my radar. And I know a lot of people. You know, VOD fans like to shit on that album. I like the album. I, you know, it's not imprint or self-titled for me, but I dig the album and the production is is great. Um, yeah, I in agree any case. with uh, everything you just said because I I like that album. Even when it came out, I I understood it because I knew I knew it wasn't for me anymore. Uh, because I'm an imprint guy and a self-titled guy too, big big time, huge VOD fan, and um, you know, I I saw that I knew that that band was just taking the turn, so I was like, well, this doesn't suck, but it's just not my favorite kind of music anymore. So all good, you know, and uh, you know, they love that stuff. They grew up on those guys at heart. I mean, there's a lot of different opinions in that band on what VOD should sound like. Everyone in that band has such wild tastes and writes different kinds of songs. Um, so they were, you know, trying to do something that could make a career out, out of that band. And they were passionate about it. There was nothing non-authentic about it. And they got all this, no. like, poser shit stuff. I'm like, these dudes love Alice in Chains. Like, they're, you know, like, this is what music that they feel good about writing. Yeah, I thought they got a bad shake at that yeah, time. Yeah, it kind of, kind of killed their career. I mean, yeah. they persevered at a, you know, a different level. But, I mean... That was like their shot. They did that deal with TVT or whatever back when TVT was something. And uh, yeah, I felt like they kind of got got a, a bad deal and that whole yeah. thing. In any case, I don't I didn't mean to bring this into like a VOD no, talk, but cool. but uh, VOD whenever I love those guys. <laughs> yeah, but Machine. Um, then he started, you know, showing up on the the metal hardcore radar more for me. I guess, um, you know, Lamb of God and Clutch. I was a big, I mean, I still like Clutch, but I, mean, I was a huge Clutch fan back in the day when they were heavier. I guess he did Pure Rock Fury and um, Blast, Blast Tyrant. Tyrant. Yep. Uh, and as far as Lamb of God goes, he was at Sacrament and at uh, uh, Ashes, yeah. The one before. Ashes of the Week. Yeah, Ashes of the Week. Yeah. I'm getting which, old. Yeah, <laughs> which is my favorite Lamb of yeah. God album, and for Same. me the essential. Um, but you know, Sacrament's quality and stuff. But that, uh, I guess, were you were around during Sacrament. You're not credited on that, or you you might have you were getting them coffee at that point, probably. Uh, I came were at just the starting very, out. Uh, very tail end of that, um, where I was like, it was done, and then my tasks were like making some files to send off once or twice and the, making chris adler like a midi kit and i didn't really get my hands on that at all whatsoever the first record i uh actually was around for start to finish was blood simple was the okay. band after the yeah. yeah that's the fir- first actual album that i ever saw get made with with machine and i was the guy making coffee and all that stuff and yeah it was cool i i, I love machine he's like I definitely would not be here whatsoever without him, like, and be being able to learn from him. He let me use his studio and his like own personal gear, expensive shit. Uh, as long as the room was free, he was like, "Yeah, whatever, just use stuff." So I had access to equipment that like I had no business touching, and um, I would just sponge everything I could and learn, watch him make records, try to apply it myself, and it all just kind of like snowballed from, from that to now, you know? So that was like, yeah, I mean, it was an awesome experience. So he let you touch his SSL or his, his Neve or. (laughs) He let me touch all the knobs and then I would blow it and not put them back and get yelled at. And he'd still let me touch stuff. So thank you. What's he touch stuff. There you go. What's he, I haven't honestly heard much involving him these days. Is he, he's still like, full bore production or is he sort of taking a step back 
Yeah, he's making records. I think um, he just worked on what's the most recent thing I saw. I think the new Amity Affliction. I think he mixed. Oh, okay. And um, he's. I know he's doing some online stuff. He just launched this machine shop live thing and out of a studio in Austin. He moved out. He built a studio out a little outside of Austin in Texas. And oh. um, he what? Uh, it's a bummer because COVID sort of ruined this really cool schedule. But he was running this like live series where bands. Um, go in jam and he kind of mixes them puts together a cool package and it's like a like a subscription style thing um but he had so many cool things lined up that probably just got side railed with you know everything that's going on um i think there's a contortionist one that's out and it's really good if you're a fan of that band uh, they did a live performance at machine studio and it's it's awesome i love language yeah yeah i think um like the the new they obviously it's like geared towards more of their newer stuff but it's very um like it was incredibly well done so i think uh i think he's working on that i know right now it was like a weird time because he probably had a lot of plans for that that are now off but i mean that's i guess the state of the world right now for everybody yeah well that's cool i maybe i just haven't been paying enough attention i i feel like i don't encounter his name as much as i used to but that's that's probably on me not him now uh you did the you did uh one of your first engineering gigs i guess at machine shop was the suicide uh suicide silence album all uh, right yeah maybe the first one where i tracked like all of an instrument like all the guitars for a record i think was was that one now what did you think about their last album and the whole um you know blowback doris and tee and and everything else um not to put you on the spot i'm curious no it's cool i um actually love ross and uh i think ross is the kind of guy who sees a band has that vision if he can put it together in his head he's this big picture dude who and that's will, ross robinson for anybody yeah. who doesn't know what the hell we're talking about yeah i mean so many so many legendary records came from him and i think um if it's the right band and the the right like if if the right if the two things it's magic and then if if it doesn't it's not you know and i think he shot a shot with that band and uh they really wanted to try to reach for something that maybe they just weren't um you know as comfortable with if you try to take a turn you have to write a lot of music if you do one thing for so long you know throwing a baseball with with your other hand takes you a minute you probably do it but you got to kind of learn got to sharpen that muscle i think it was just maybe like their first dive into that stuff without working the kinks out as much you know and ross is just wild man he'll put you he'll take you down that path if uh if you want to go there and you know it it works for some people and it crashes and burns for others but they probably like that record a ton man and i'm sure they're all proud of it and you're you know the deathcore community uh, was not going to receive that record there's just no way you know so it's like they probably knew that going into it anyway and and just didn't give a shit wanted to do what they want so good on them for wanting to do what they want you know yeah yeah i can respect that uh what was i gonna say and then i guess you left the mach- you left machine in what 2000 10 ish yeah we worked together um i've been we shared a studio for years um we moved into a building about 10 years ago and we probably shared the building for like four years maybe five i don't even know anymore um and then he went to texas to build his studio and i've just kind of took over the building and that's where you know we've been making records since okay and in those years you've done a shitload of <laughs> yeah. uh, household names in the metalcore, deathcore world. I mean, even uh, just did this a bunch year. of four day, four today albums, the Acacia Strain. Um, I could run down a whole list, but it'd probably bore people. Let's just say you seem to have been involved in, in I don't know. Every say, time I die, not lose big, vein counterparts. Yeah, it's like Will Putney, Kurt Ballou, uh, um mark lewis got a few in there mark lewis, <laughs> mark uh, lewis. i know yeah yeah 
I'm spacing on a couple names, but <laughs> no, that's cool. I mean, there's like I've been, handful. yeah, I um, I definitely have been busy. I haven't stopped working um, ever, <laughs> and really, I don't really take a lot. This is kind of all I do. Um, I think we had six days off last year, you know, um, but it's cool. It doesn't like feel like work. I like that people want to make records with me, and I don't want to miss any opportunities too. So we just go and burn it. Um, and yeah, lately it's been like, I think 2019, I had a blast, maybe one of my favorite years with all the bands that came through and, um, yeah, we've, we've been pretty nonstop cause I don't, I don't want to be the guy that kind of disappears cause I get lazy and I make less records. I want to keep pushing what I can do and get better and sharpening my skills. And I think everybody in my staff feels like that. All the engineers that work with me are becoming incredible engineers and producers in their own right so it's like yeah we're just going man we're not stopping anytime soon no that's that's awesome that's you're it's funny you're doing what i wanted to do when i was a teenager you know uh i went to school i got my worthless degree in audio engineering and did a few internships in philadelphia at like three in the morning and got the shits of it and um, got into computers and on the side did this stupid Lambo thing. And, um, you know, that was when I was learning, it was still real to real two inch, uh, you know, pro tools was there, but it was, uh, nascent. And I felt bad for a lot of the people that I, you know, went to school with who basically trained in these big name studios, cutting tape with razors and, um, you know, you've got to have a Neumann microphone and you've got to have a Studer, uh, reel to reel, 24 track. And then computers came along and blew the whole thing open uh, to the degree where people who just learn how to do shit on their computer, you know, suddenly came to the forefront and, and sort of uh, blew up an entire industry as I see it. So I was grateful to have uh, exited that industry. Uh, but obviously it, it does work out for some people such as yourself. Um, so long story short, you're doing what I wanted to do. I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, and now you're I'm posting right. about you. I feel <laughs> like, it, I feel like anybody who can make a living being involved in music is extremely fortunate nowadays. You know, it's just getting harder and harder for bands to survive and for people who cover bands and, you know, with the COVID thing so much press has scaled back like and, 2020's uh, rough yeah it's not a great time to do a non-essential business like creating art you know and um like if you could weather the storm like i would just feel super lucky you know i mean i worked my ass off but it could have went the other way super fast too so i not, i never really take that for granted it's just... not i think you got a great perspective there i'm sorry dave i just Maybe you can answer this question for me, Will, because I was wondering about this the other day, and I didn't really ask anyone. What happened to Joey Sturgis? Like, he would produce album after album, and I, like, he has no, from what I could find, no recent credits. Uh, what what the hell is he doing these days? I know he's still active. Sure, yeah. Uh, Joey uh, got into software, so he runs, like, a plugging company, um, and I believe he's doing pretty good with it, and... Um, I think the taste of uh, band shifted maybe in production styles too. Um, Cause I know for a minute there, everybody wanted records to sound like his. And then there was like right. a run of bands who purposely didn't want to sound like that. Cause they were like, well, everybody else sounds like this, just this one sound, you know, fans got kind of wise to like, Hey, it would be good if our record sounded unique. And uh, not to say that Joey couldn't make a unique sounding record. Everyone has their, style and sound and bag of tricks um but the i same thing that made him big sort of ended up biting him in the ass i guess yeah i think like. that can happen you know if you don't um try to evolve and try to stay fresh and i don't know if joey is super dug into underground music i know he's very passionate about producing and engineering and he's definitely he's definitely a talented guy um but i, I don't know how far his like roots go really into like what's going to be the next big band why is this cool like if he heard vane would he have understood like i was like messaging vane like i have to record you like would he would he have understood that if he heard it you know i, I i'm not sure i can't speak for it i i think joey's a good dude and um 
he found a way to be successful and he seems comfortable in his life. So like more, more power to him, you know? Um, Agreed. but yeah, I think I learned from that like era of bands all wanting to sound the same. And then everybody wanted to sound different all at once. It's like stuff gets sterile. If you just copy other bands, like the downfall of all these sub genres too, something comes out, it makes a wave. It's awesome. It's the new thing. Then there's like a thousand bands that just do that thing. And it's, you know, like you're just, you get over a style of music so fast because you, you've already heard it. You know, it's, it becomes predictable. It becomes less exciting. And I think, um, I've learned from all of that. Like I've studied all of this. And I, I try to stay uh, like a little ahead of it, a little more evolved. I purposely avoid the obvious, like sometimes. And, you know, I think it'll help sustain me a little more long-term. I worry about not being able to do this, you know? So I, I, I try to stay ahead of that stuff, but some people might not care and might just be like, this is what I do. It's easy. I get paid. It's awesome. You know? Um, Cause this is harder trying to make records like this and trying to do shit that doesn't sound like anybody else. Like it definitely sucks more. It's more hours, you know? Um, so I don't know, but Joey's cool. We're good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. I'm sorry, Dave. You're good. I interrupted you. Go ahead. I was thinking, um, how has your schedule changed since the pandemic? I mean, is that changed your whole year or, or are bands still going to be coming in and, and recording? I made a record in quarantine. Can't say who because I can't couldn't tell you when that's going to come out at this point. But you um, did a new Slayer album. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah, you, uh, that's all right. <laughs> I saw some weird racist stuff pop up today. Remove me from Slayer. If that's all right. Oh, they canceled too. I can't even keep up. I don't, I don't know. I can't keep up. I'm just yeah yeah. I'm a, I'm I'm in, I'm a part of cancel culture, so I uh, I can't associate. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> I moved my spring records to later in the year. Um, I think it was just safe for everyone. There was some international stuff and a lot of bands that had to travel. And there's some family stuff around me with pre-existing conditions where I had to be a little extra careful about, um, about who was going to be around stuff. I actually lived at the studio for weeks to make sure I wasn't going to catch symptoms or be contagious, forced a band to quarantine themselves for like weeks before we even got into the studio together. Um, and, uh, now I'm enjoying, I was about to enjoy downtime, but now I'm working on this cherry thing. So there's yeah. not a, there's not going to be a lot of downtime. I'm, I'm getting back to it sooner rather than later. We have some, we have some studio renovation plans and stuff. We're keeping busy, but, um, it definitely threw a tire iron in the year for me. And, uh, a lot of stuff that I thought I was going to be able to record towards the end of the year. Now I can't because, you know, that real estate got got kind of eaten up by my spring but i have a lot of records on the books still so i'm excited that once you know the world resets i'll be able to get back to work does and you mentioned sorry sorry go ahead <laughs> this this two host thing really sucks <laughs> sometimes go uh but the records that get pushed do those get pushed all together and they have to find somewhere else to record or someone else to record them or do they just get pushed to next year or i mean do how does the band feel about, or how do bands feel about that? Everybody was pretty comfortable sort of just shifting at once. It was a lot of, it was a lot of phone calls. I was trying to juggle a lot of people's schedules and these are like, you know, legitimate bands that have plans that keep changing. So I was trying to be as accommodating as possible to everyone, but everybody was super understanding. It's like, Hey, we can't do, I don't think we can do this now. We're going to have to do this here. And then I'd call the next band and be like, so this band has to record here so can we do you know i was just like making you know everyone was very cool and kind of understanding that hey this is all a disaster for everybody so let's just figure out how we can make it work for everyone go ahead alex oh i was just gonna you had mentioned uh your upcoming charity event so i thought this would probably be a good opportunity for Segway. you to discuss that if you wanted to give the uh you know, whatever the two minute pitch here, tell people what it's about, what you have going on. I'm sure you can do a better job than I in explaining it. Sure. No problem. I, uh, I'm running sort of a live telethon style event. Um, it's going to be two days actually. It started as one. Now it's two because the response was really awesome. Um, sort of an open forum discussion. I've got a lot of artists and managers 
label guys, you know, event organizers, just people that um, are from our community who kind of care about what's going on in the world right now. And uh, everyone's going to come on. We kind of shoot the shit 15, 20 minutes, do some giveaways. All, there's a gigantic raffle charity giveaway. You, you, you donate $10, you get split between a few charities. And, um, you know, you're entered to win some re- really cool stuff from all the people that are involved. Um, it's going to be really, really cool. I have such a cool, diverse lineup of people from different genres and different bands, different walks of life. And um, well, go ahead and brag, know. man. Go ahead and brag about some of the names <laughs> that everybody's going to recognize. Let me just let me get a list. Hang out. Yeah, I have it pulled up one. already. If you want me to go for it. Sure. When does this air, by the way? Wednesday. This okay, week, so Wednesday? I can give you the I can give you the updated list because I think we'll be live with it by then. So I put out the original um, announcement, and I was, you know, the first thing I did was I kind of reacted to what was going on in the world. Like this is all fucked up. I hate that I'm sitting here and watching this. I didn't feel I don't feel good about any of this. I don't feel good that I didn't do anything when the Ferguson shit broke out last time and uh I'm watching my friends like suffer, actually suffer this time. And um it just hit closer to home. It hit really close to home with some of my with some of my buddies and I was I was just feeling it. I was like, I'm home, I'm literally just sitting on a couch watching the world go to shit. Um I'm gonna call some guys and bands and we're gonna try to we're going to do something about it. So I put this lineup together, which is dudes I've recorded, you know, put it out. And um, it's a lot of guys in cool bands, you know, Four Year Strong, Thy Art, you know, Incendiary Counterparts, and Not Blue Sense Spelled, uh, Great American Ghost, got Ice-T from Body Count coming on, Doc from Bad Wolves, Harm's Way, Every Time I Die, Kurt from Converge, you know, Terror Dudes, Trivium Guys. Just, just all the buddies, people we've worked with before, et cetera. And then I put it up and I realized, like, cool, I've got, like, a bunch of white dudes in bands who are going to talk about <laughs> Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And I got I got checked on it pretty good from a few people. And, um, you know, I've spent almost, a, you know, almost, like, since it went up on Friday, I was like, I, I actually think I made a mistake here. I need to go um, – I need to go get voices from the black community in, in our world. And I need to give them the platform. Oh, what the fuck am I supposed to talk about here? You know, this isn't like, I want to be supportive of that whole struggle, but I don't want to pretend I'm any kind of expert or know how I'm uh, have an idea how to solve what's going on in this world. All I can do is like make it more of a platform for these black artists to come on and kind of give us some guidance. Like, tell me what, we should do, you know, like hear their stories, take their advice. And, um, since that lineups out, you know, I was like really, really, you know, fortunate to get a lot of people from this community on like guys from bad rabbits, the singer of dare. I've got Derek from Sepultura. I've got, um, the singer of hacktivist, Jay Hurley, Jay from unity, like, um, Joe from wisdom and chains, it's just a crazy list of people and like scout who runs, um, breakthrough free fest, which is like a really cool festival that they put together for minority groups and, um, people of color. And, you know, it, it's been like, uh, this awesome learning experience the past few days, taking advice and suggestions from that. I feel like what I, what is important and now I think I'm going to take away so much more from this. And this is going to be something that's really positive for like our, our whole world to actually listen and learn and, you know, raise a shit ton of money with some awesome giveaways. And, you know, it's just, it's just was something I thought like I had to do this time. Well, it sounds like a cool event. That's for sure. Uh, it's very interesting. And even more so now that we know it's two days, that's also cool. Uh, what, when it will, during the day or is it an evening thing i don't see a time on here more tba uh, i'll probably start it at noon i'm just working out everybody's schedules just like trying to put a festival together and make sure everybody can be on at the times and everyone's busy doing different things so i'm working out the schedule over the next day or two but i think noon we'll probably start we'll, we'll have big days um and it, you know i'm just gonna try to cram as many people as I can into two days to have these cool discussions and 
give away a ton of stuff. I mean, there's like over a hundred artists who have donated for this for this giveaway. I think it's going to raise a ton of money. Anybody wants to check this out or participate, where what do they do? Where do they go? Uh, Soundrink, S O U N D R I N K dot live. Soundrink dot live. Um, I'll keep that site updated. That's where we're going to stream it. You can start making donations now. We're going to leave it up before and after um, the event. And I'll try to keep that updated with information about the people who are speaking and a little more info about what the giveaways are going to be. I'm trying to, as soon as we get off this chat, I'm going to start putting together all these giveaway packages and making little promo things. So my night's busy, like organizing all that, but that should all get out pretty soon. Um, but sounds where we're hosting it. That's where the show goes on. And, um, yeah, I'll just keep, you know, updating, having everybody update social media and letting people know what we're giving away and who's going on when. And that oh, is awesome. June 14th and 15th, correct? Yeah. You said that earlier. Yeah, that's sure. correct. All right, cool. Well, I applaud you for doing it, man. It sounds like it's going to be a, a really positive thing. and it, it always takes somebody to step forward and do something. Um, you know, in their corner of the world, and it sounds like you you're one of the people who has stepped forward. So good job. I appreciate it. I feel like I needed to. Um, I feel like we've been socially active before and supported different causes with the bands, doing charity things, and um, this one just like hit different for me. I felt um like very compelled to like try to unite people from this community to to rally up for this because i think this black lives matter movement needs all the attention it could get from our world and i wanted to uh i wanted to end you know i don't want to have to do this charity event in two years when so another black who gets shot you know uh, with his hands in the air or somebody get, gets choked to death like i'm we're all everybody's tired of it nobody wants this in america anymore yeah. you know so we're 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 gonna we'll do my do my little part give other people a platform and you know just keep moving it forward yeah no that makes sense and uh you know we'd be remiss to ignore what's transpired in our metalcore community uh you know in the past week and it's i know crazy yeah you, know, you you worked with uh you worked on the latest norma jean album i think and you worked on the latest the ghost inside album so you have sort of a uh, unfortunately, you have a front row seat to some of this stuff. Uh, I guess I would, I'll ask the question this way. For Jim Riley or Corey Brandon, and not that they, you know, the same things are, are going down with both of them, but what advice do you give somebody in that, that sort of predicament uh, where they've uh, owned up to something uh, that they've done that they're not proud of, uh, and you have a portion of the uh, community saying, you know, see ya, bye. We're not going to deal with this. And another portion saying, you know, you deserve a chance uh, to, to rehabilitate yourself, to learn, to become a better person, et cetera, et cetera. What, what sort of advice if, if Corey called or not, no, I don't even want to focus on Corey. If Jim Riley called you and maybe has, you know, what what kind of advice would you give someone in that situation? I think, um, you know, I I do believe that people can change. Um I'm not going to pretend I'm some kind of saint and that I haven't laughed at a racist joke in my life or said something off color as a joke. You know, I think if what um, that story that was getting circulated is what Jim said, then I think he, you know, he's got a lot of soul searching to do. You know, it's it's crazy to think that I could be in a band with somebody who would say that to another person in that, you know, in an, in an angry way, in an aggressive way like that, in a hurtful way. Um, and I can't speak for, you know, I can only speak for how I would react. And if I saw that happen or if that happened, that person would be out of my band. So I can understand the decision. I also don't think that Jim is a racist person. Um, I'm sure that fucked him up when it happened. And I'm sure he uh, wouldn't do that today, you know, but uh, it's not up to me or Jim, like what, um, who's going to forgive him, who's going to think it's cool and who's going to think it's not cool, who thinks he should be in the band and not. It's, it's definitely not up to me. And um, he definitely apologized and um, people heard it. Some people are cool with it and some people aren't. I think um, 
it's up to Jim now to do things in his life to, you know, make amends for it and show that he's not that kind of person, which I think he will, because at his core, I don't think he's an evil guy. I don't think he's a racist guy, but I think he did something wild and it came out and it hurt a lot of people and it hurt a lot of people in our world. And it's the type of thing where you could say sorry, but you have to show you're sorry. Um, and if, you know, if he does that and he works towards a positive goal, eventually maybe most people will think like, Hey man, that dude, that dude did his time, you know, like maybe he could, I watched this guy do these great things. And I think he actually learned his lesson. Like, cool, go play bass in a band again. You know, who knows? Like I, it's not up for me to decide. And I like, I just can only speak for like how I would react if I heard somebody in my band like aggressively say that to another person that it wouldn't fly for me. So I get what the ghost inside did, you know? Um, but people, you know, I don't really, I don't really know what else I could say other than, uh, I wish shit like that didn't happen, you know? And I, and it sucks that people I know intimately, you know, have to, um, come to terms with that shit now but it's real now you know we've had some of these conversations with within you know my groups of friends and with other dudes and bands about like hey like shit that used to be funny is not funny like it's not funny to make these kinds of jokes anymore like it's a it's different i think people can learn from you can look back at your past and go what the fuck did i do why did i say that why did i laugh at that and realize like the consequences that um come from like being okay with that kind of shit you know and i think now um i don't think i think it's going to be a different climate now and i think um once all the canceling stuff happens which it, you know for better or worse is gonna expose people and stuff like i think where uh if there's one positive takeaway is i think um uh, people in the hardcore metal community are not going to be fucking down with racism at all you know and people are going to get checked on stuff like that from here out, probably forever, you know. So it's a it's an awakening, you know, for for a lot of people right now. I feel it like I've been, you know, this whole week I'm sitting here and I'm going, yeah, it's a different world now. Like people people have to take responsibility for that and people have to do their best to support, you know, black communities, minority communities, gay communities it doesn't matter anymore like yeah. it's it's that shit is over that stigma around any one group of people is just like never gonna fly in america again i think i think it's good to see that that's where the point we're at you know so there's a positive takeaway from all this negative shit this week if you want it <laughs> i've said no, it. I, I appreciate that and i i do uh at the core of it i agree i think you know this is it feels to me like a real turning point not not that you know racism or anything is going to go away but as far as uh, the average level of awareness uh in you know largely white uh communities and let's face it metal and metalcore are largely white they they hopefully won't be forever and there's certainly exceptions but your average uh, metal deathcore metalcore hardcore band whatever is four or five white dudes who don't have the, the perspective uh, or haven't had the perspective. And I think this is a big wake up call, whether people are uh, more hesitant or completely uh, opposed to uh, that kind of language or humor, whether it's because they're genuinely, they genuinely understand or they're just scared to do it for the fear of fallout. Anyway, you slice it. If it's done and it gets eradicated, then I think that's a good thing. And it's, you know, unfortunate that we're going to have a few casualties along the way um, in terms of careers uh, for people that do get canceled, which I'm not a proponent of. Uh, but again, uh, it's big picture wise. I think this is a positive thing for our yeah. scene. I mean, it's, we just, you know, everybody feels this now. And if you don't feel like things are changing, then there's, there's a problem, you know? And, uh, I haven't spoken to a band dude or anybody who's involved in this all week who hasn't been like wildly affected you know, and, fe and feels like regret and call it white guilt if you want, but there's a layer of that. Like we have to hold a few people accountable and we have to all work on being better people. Like, and I do agree that a community that's predominantly white 
has made mistakes, you know. I can own up to laughing at racist jokes and and saying wild stuff as a kid, and I know now, like, I, uh, it's just wrong, you know. And and I think a lot of people are looking in the mirror and going, yeah, I gotta do better. I gotta change. I gotta like, you know, I gotta figure. You know, I I don't think a lot of people are thinking about it now, as if like it's an option to just not be a better person and not do racist shit or 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 you know be a bigot or put down another community i just i think it will it's gonna weed itself out of this world like it should like it used to like it used to do you know yeah i think Nazis a lot more used people to go are to shows going to get uh... the shit kicked out of them by hardcore kids and it's like <laughs> yeah you know it's a different it's a different climate now and uh you know i think a lot of stuff on the i think the internet lets a lot of stuff go wild people can say whatever they want without consequences you know but uh there's consequences now like it's it's very it's very present. Everyone's everyone's aware of consequences, which yeah. feels good, you know. I think people are going to yeah. hold other people accountable a lot better now, or you know, a lot more militantly now. Yeah, yeah. It seems like do the right thing or get the f out. Yeah, it's a different time, man. And uh, trust me, all the bands feel it, and uh, I can see this change is going to happen, you know. And whether or not they got bullied into feeling like they got they they have to change they're all going to change you know and um uh that's good it's a positive takeaway from it yeah. from a really dark time you know i think a lot of the younger bands already were coming with that kind of attitude to begin with i think more so it's the established bands that uh you know grew up or came up in a much different climate that probably will have to you know morph into the new environment that we're going into more so than the younger bands because you have bands that are pretty outspoken like turn uh, turnstile and knock loose and some other bands like that uh it seems like the younger generation is more hip with it grown up with the internet you know in a, in a different relationship than say our our age demographic so it seems like a good, yeah. good thing good thing happening i agree with you i think um if the internet existed um in 1997 like it does now um we would have skipped a phase of this stuff <laughs> you know i think people would have been more exposed to the information that would have led them to believe that okay this shit's wrong this isn't funny these aren't words you say you know uh, this this is not how you treat people um you know it's is there's the pros and cons to everything the internet um definitely puts the ugliness of the world at your front door and uh the hardcore scene luckily nowadays is very aware of that and very um very interested in protecting people from minority communities and black communities and gay communities and i think it's 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 a good thing it's good to see now yeah uh, i'm with you i think you know you just hit the nail on the head as far as the internet and social media goes i mean twitter in particular you see the worst of the world on twitter but if you don't see that uh, you can't deal with it. You can't confront it. You're not going to do anything about it. it. Just continues to get swept under the rug. So uh, uh, you can't have, uh, you can't fix this stuff if you don't know about it or you don't have it shoved in your face. And I think that's kind of Twitter in a nutshell. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we'll be a better world for it uh, in the very near future. Near future. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to this weekend because. I'm looking for this advice from this community, you know, and I think tuning in and listening to people express what we can do to be better people is going to be uh, a really awesome learning experience, you know. So I hope everybody watches the, this this thing this weekend um, to give all these artists this opportunity to t tell you what to do right, you know, tell you how to how to support this Black Lives Matter movement, how to check your racist friends, how to, you know, this the whole thing. I'm looking forward to, I want to learn from this stuff. I want to wake up Monday or Tuesday and just feel better already <laughs> about, about this yeah. and go into the world and know, and be a little more comfortable knowing how, how I should carry myself, how I should handle certain situations, you know? For sure. Well, I, I second that advice. Everybody tune the freak in and, and learn something or, share something in whatever capacity you, you have. Uh, I'm getting depressed now. So <laughs> let's quick. Uh, I was gonna, I was curious. Uh, we at least have to talk about the every time I die record, right? 
What? I would love to talk about the Every We time at least I have record, to mention the Every Time I Die record coming out. It's supposedly going to be the best Every Time I Die record. Oh, well. E Pit is a shining light in the world for me right now. Because I know by the end of the year, when the world opens back up, that we get to have that out there and it's going to feel good. Um, it's it's awesome. We, um, we, we spent so much time on this record. Probably one of the longest recording experiences I've had. The amount of hours. I think we put like 500 hours into it. 16 songs, so many cool different vibes. Like, band is just on fire right now. I don't know how the band gets better. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I hope uh, I could crack that code one day. But, like, for how long they've been doing this style to just sound like a brand new band is just crazy to me. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Can't say well, no. I'm, start, I'm starting to get worried how long before Andy quits to uh, wrestle. They've got a really good balance. Um, I think. Um, those guys growing up together and being friends for so long and doing that band for so long, they know how to navigate the personalities and the schedules really well with that band and are super supportive of Andy too. And Andy put a pretty hard stance on the wrestling thing. I've got to be here for this record. I can, you got to fly me back and forth. Every time he went to wrestle, he's on an airplane back and, and back the next day in the studio. I mean, I couldn't keep up with that schedule. He's, and he's getting, not just on an airplane, on an airplane, then he gets the shit kicked out of him by like another giant man. And then he's like up the next day and we're like tracking guitars, you know, and it's, it's nuts. Those guys are uh, from another planet. Um, but yeah, they, I don't think, um, I think each is going to be just fine, you know? Yeah. They've been fine for quite, quite some time. They're one of the monoliths that have withstand, withstood the 20 year grind, so to speak. Yeah. I'm uh, very fortunate that I get to work with them, and that we become friends, and yeah. Is there a set date for that, or is that still pushed back a little bit from the? Couldn't tell you. I uh, I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon. Unfortunately, I'm sure they want to tour on that record like everybody. Uh, it would be a real disservice to that record uh, if they had to stay home when it came out. I don't even think they'd be comfortable doing it. You know they're such a good they're such a live band and they're gonna probably want to play so much of this new stuff uh i don't think we'll see that record until we see touring you know interesting well it sounds like it'll be worth the wait it will be it's got my seal of approval for whatever <laughs> the hell that means I'm really proud of that uh, one. uh don't sell yourself short i think that means a great deal right now uh i wanted to ask you how did you, how did you get hooked up with ice tea and body count how did I get hooked up with Ice T? Um, Sean Keith, who worked at Sumerian back in the yeah, day, yeah, I remember. I had done, him. Had done a bunch of records with him, and um, he uh, we worked really good together. I knew um, they knew when they brought Body Count in that they wanted to go to like a younger guy, somebody who kind of was not from that generation. Someone was that was from my, you know, the, a younger generation to kind of refresh the band um and have like you know, have some newer ideas because you know body count's great but they definitely have a style and they they played that style for so long and they were kind of off for a long time you know so you have some of these guys who hadn't been playing music for 10 years like coming back and i think they just wanted somebody young in the room to just kind of throw ideas and see what works and um i met with ice the first time i went to his house and he um we listened to death metal records and I watched them like tweet crazy stuff to politicians. And I was like, this is a surreal moment for me. Um, so I was a, I was a big body count fan. And I'm guessing he doesn't live in a, uh, you know, a trailer in the woods. I'm not going to speak on anything where he lives. He's a private man. <laughs> um, but we, um, we, uh, yeah, we hit it off good. And we, we, it turned into this really cool working relationship. I've done like three records with them now. And, um, it's great. I feel like they they value my opinion, which is cool, and they uh, we try to make stuff that's socially relevant, super entertaining at the same time. They definitely do like two polar things, you know. They'll write like a song about the craziest, almost goofy stuff, and then they'll write like a very socially aware song, and it's it's on the next track. So it's like, yeah, it's fun. It's passion project shit for for him too. Like the guy, if anybody doesn't need to do a band, Ice T doesn't right. need to do a band. <laughs> You know what I mean? And sure. he's only doing it because he loves it. He loves Those law and order checks go a long way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I follow Ice-T on Twitter and that dude, uh, he's total entertainer. Yeah, he's totally fine. And he's got hands in so much stuff. And, you know, he's an icon. He's like the, you know, 
A level celebrity shit, and he uh, does a metal band because he likes to say "fuck you" to stuff, and that's the coolest yeah. thing in the world. I'm interested. You, do you, Do you remember what death metal records you guys were listening to at his house? Um, he showed me Six Feet Under because he actually had did a part on a Six Feet Under track, and uh, we jammed Cannibal, I think some Napalm Death, and then I showed him some new stuff. I think I showed him Stray. So I was like, you'll, you'll like Stray, and he does. And it, it, that was like a, I was like, I got one that I know you're going to like. And then um, I, sh- I was like, we talked about Hatebreed. He's buddies with Joss the two. So we like had a little, had a little geek out about Hatebreed and some other thrash bands. You know, his, his like, he's got a good thrash upbringing. I think when Body Count was popping off, that was like a pretty, um, that was like that scene where they spent a lot of time too, because thrash metal was like at a at a, at a peak then also. Mm-hmm. Um, so he knows, you know, all the all the classic thrash bands. He's pretty dialed in on. Yeah, yeah. He's, he. Yeah, he's no poser. He's no, he's not. He's like, you know, he's not checking Lambo in the morning <laughs> to see like uh, when the pre orders go up for what the end That's, record or whatever. But, yeah, he does follow us on in. Twitter. I was yeah. stoked when he followed me. I was like, "Oh shit, it's ice fucking tea." He knows what he's he knows what he's supposed to know. He's still connected to this world through a variety of people. And um, when there's something important to do, or when there's like something important that he feels like he needs to say, he gets in, he does a record, and that's it. Goes back to being an actor. Now you actually you actually did correct me if I'm wrong. You did some writing for them. I mean some. Some riffs, uh, whatever, are, are yours? Yeah, we do. We you weren't just together. turning knobs. No, I, I mean, I do that with a nice chunk of bands. I like to jam with bands. I like to take song starts from bands, see what, uh, let them go first, like kind of see, keep the identity of the band intact, and then I don't mind hopping in and throwing ideas in too. So a lot of collaborative stuff um, with those guys on a couple of records, check a couple of riffs in, you know. Just I, it's so something you, that I think is part of producing nowadays. So I like feel comfortable doing it with most of the bands that you know I work with that are into that kind of thing. You have official writing credits on a bunch of albums, or are you like a, a non-credited writer? Yeah, yeah, I've got. Uh, I mean, I don't know what's public knowledge and what isn't, but hundreds of songs. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, well, a bunch of them appear to be on. You know all credits or one of these you know sites because i was looking through some of them and yeah if this were 1960 you'd be you'd be loaded in a songwriting credit royalty yeah we talk about that sometimes just want just missed it by a generation and uh, yeah it's fine it's going good i'm not complaining but we'd all be well, we, we laugh at the studio because if we would if we rewind the clock 10 years with the scale of bands we were doing we'd all be on yacht somewhere right now laughing yeah and uh actually oh. no we'd probably still be doing hardcore records and charity events and shit like that but i mean it's a nice that's what nice you mission. say but you'd be on a yacht man. <laughs> yeah paychecks can change people i've seen that all of a sudden my college friends get republican and shit i don't know. i'm not broke but i definitely uh don't have enough money where i think my perspective can change on the world i don't see that happening anytime soon um, yeah. Well, it's easy to be Republican when you're in, you know, the top one percent tax bracket. And, yeah, and I'm not uh, shitting on Republicans because it's not a Republican thing. Everybody sucks, but Republicans get the tax breaks. We're we're, we're there. We're not. We're not really. Uh, I'm not going to deny that. But, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of, uh, um, you know, generations previous, uh, as someone obviously in tune to production engineering, what are some uh, what are some, in your estimation, from a production standpoint, some of the greatest, for you personally, some of the greatest albums, um, you know, production-wise? Are we talking like Dark Side of the Moon and, you know, give us a Dark few. What, what really would you yeah. put up there? Um, it's all the obvious stuff. Class, all the, like, the Led Zeppelin records, Fours, Psycho, and the I love the, I actually like The Wall. A lot of people like Dark Side, but I'm like a... A more wall dude not really a classic rock guy to be honest because i grew up with a lot of soft rock in my house my parents were very um billy joel and elton john and neil diamond so They're i think good, uh, good i grew up light i grew up really light so i don't have this like great classical you know classic rock like upbringing or anything like that but um the grunge stuff is where i really like love 
the productions, Sound, Soundgarden Records and House and Chain stuff. That was like probably my sweet spot because that's like when I found rock music, you know. Um, it, it was all like, it was all really gentle, soft love ballad stuff until like I found Nirvana and Soundgarden and, and you know, that era and kind of, that's when I kind of turned and got into more aggressive music and stuff. So those all have like a special place in my heart. They're just nostalgic to me. So when I hear those records, I just love the way they sound. Um, and then maybe recent shout outs. How about recent shout outs? I like mm-hmm. putting up other producers. Um, who's awesome. Let's see. Mark Lewis is awesome. Um, Josh Wilbur is awesome. Josh Wilbur Lord. is, uh, Josh Wilbur worked under Andy Wallace. So he has, magic magical ears right now well he's um, a legend wallace yes who else is awesome i want to give a shout out to randy labeouf randy labeouf was the guy who was a engineer under me for a few years and um now he's making his own records randy did the new uh case of strange stuff right. that's all out he did the new kubicon record left behind i am just finished chamber um he's killing it and i'm now i'm getting those like dude that new record sounds good i'm like yeah that was randy that wasn't that wasn't me. Go tell him that, you know. He's the so, next Will Putney. <laughs> no, he's he's Randy. We we were different. We're different. <laughs> we do stuff different. He's um you know, we have shared approaches, but he's definitely um he's definitely got a very very musical mind. Probably more we think in different ways, you know. He's a Berkeley guy, amazing guitar player, piano player. Um you know, we're into we have similar tastes, but we're into different stuff too and um some of the stuff he's working on right now is is really cool. I I don't know if I should say what project uh, it's for, but he's writing a ton of music at the studio right now, and you know it's awesome. So shout out shout out to Randy. Nice. All right. Well, I think you you gave the appropriate shout outs. I you know Dave makes fun of me because I like Billy Joel, um, and he has no respect for Billy Joel, which pisses me off. No, no I have no he respect for that. the Beatles. I don't mind Billy Joel. I'll say that. How do you not have respect for the Beatles? I mean, I respect the Beatles. I just don't enjoy their music. It's just, uh, I know everything in music is, you know, from that, but it's also from a time when there's only like one to three channels on TV. So, yeah, I feel you. I, um, I listen to those records now and I can appreciate them. I think I had a backlash against all that stuff as a kid. Cause I would go from Elton John to Dr. Dre, you know, yeah, I was the same way, kind yeah. of a lot of that. I I listened to my parents' music, and then I started around the same time you started finding your own version of rock and roll that you liked uh, with grunge. I started doing that, and I also started listening to like Snoop Dogg and MC Hammer around this, or, around that same time. So I was listening to rap and like grunge a lot growing yeah. up. It was just so extreme to your virgin young ears to hear. People you've never, you know, I, I did not, I was not exposed to that culture as, as a child where I grew up and, and then hearing records like that, I was like, what is this? What is, this? I have to learn everything about it, you know? So I, it was, it's cool. It, it's cool to get hit like that as a kid. It kind of shocked yeah. the system. I had the hey, same experience. More in the world, with, you know? I had the same experience with Public Enemy and that was sort of a, a life changing thing for me. Um, yeah. You know, I as a white think, suburban kid. I think Fear of a Black Planet is still the hardest uh, album title ever. An amazing album. I yeah. still, you know, I was jamming a Welcome to the Terror Dome the other day. And, uh, yeah, that album. That, and the, I mean, like, when I was, like, 12, you know, I thought the Bomb Squad was, like, the fucking coolest <laughs> thing ever. Like, this production team, anything the Bomb Squad touches is gold. You want and, uh, I, don't, you want I don't know what ever happened to those guys, but. Let me give you a little inside one. So we we started Welcome to the Terror Dome as a body count cover for the last record. Um, and then realized we weren't going to do it justice, so can it. But it almost got done. Um, we had a that. whole band thing going, jamming on it, everything. Maybe one day we'll finish it. But uh, yeah, Ice came in and was like, I don't think we're going to do it better. I'm like, I, I think you might be right. Maybe we just do something else. Yeah. Nobody's doing that song better. Yeah. Yeah, Chuck D at his prime. You can't top that. You know what's crazy though? If you watch the live videos, the band was like bad, like actually bad. But it was still fun and crazy because they just they just had a band up there, like jet, kind of doing whatever while they're while they're just hitting verses and stuff. And uh, it's not very good, but it's also it's, it's also just like 
pure entertainment. So fun to watch. What try to find yeah. some live videos where they're doing that, where they're doing that song with a band. It's it's awesome. I didn't even know that existed. I'm yeah. kind of scared, but I might check that out. YouTube rabbit hole um, coming up. If uh, one final thing I wanted to ask, if um, you know, you could go back and sort of be handed the production uh, reins on a metal, you know, an iconic metal album. Does anything come to mind? Like, God, I wish I had had the chance to engineer, uh, record, mix, master that. Well, who cares about mastering? But uh, mix that record. Uh, anything yeah, come to go, mind? I'm going to go with the obvious because it's just. Don't say injustice for all. Oh, close. I was going to go stay in anger. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's too obvious. If, uh, I had yeah. two, if I had two years with Metallica, two years, maybe more. Was it more than two years? I don't even know. But the, that was the, a few years. the resources for that, man, Bob Rock's cool. No no disrespect to Bob Rock, but I would have count. I would have made a record. <laughs> you give two years with Metallica, we would have had some you mean, You mean you wouldn't have come up with that same snare sound? Uh, you know what? I like the snare sound. Oh. You know why uh, I like it? Because how many people do you know know what snares sound like on records? And how many people do you know can talk about that snare sound? I like that snare sound for that for that reason. Is it objectively good? I don't know. But uh, people who don't talk about recording talk about a snare drum on a record. You know? I, that's interesting. You mentioned that. That's You know, I'm trying to think right now. Like snare sounds to me. I'm like, all right, uh, snap case, progression through unlearning. Yes, that's one. Very great, good. great snare. Um, Primus suck on this. Their first uh, album, which was recorded live, the snare is so in your face. I always loved it. Um, and even their the next album, Frizzle Fry, snare is nice. Yeah, and, so uh, you're a, you're a high tune snare guy. You like the high. You like the. High I, I don't want to say for sure, but yeah, that sort of stuff sticks with me. Um, Dude, that's know, where, that's where Saint Anger. That's where Saint Anger took a turn. They they went low, too low, little, just a little too low. That thing was up just a little people would love yeah yeah well that's funny um because i can't argue anything what you said if you watch some kind of monster and see the amount of effort that went into that album and no disrespect to metallica about what came out the other end it's an unfortunate (laughs) waste of resources it's an insane way of saying that but yes i i couldn't disagree with that but you know I'm a big Metallica fan, so everybody gets one. You know, you get a pass on a record. So that's true. But but the, I think the census is they've had a couple passes, no? I don't know. I like uh, there's tunes on load and reload, and there's death magnetic stuff that I like. That opening track's good. I don't care. It's good. I do like load and I'm, reload as well. Yeah, I so. I tuned out after the Black Album, honestly. But I I think as far as cringeworthy material. You know, there's not been a whole lot. I mean, St. Anger and some of the load stuff, I think, qualifies. But they've certainly sort of gotten back to, to business. And I think, you know, for guys that have been around for so long um, and done what they've done, they could come out with a freaking jazz album and whatever. They've, yeah, they've, they get a pass. You know, they yeah, they're, they can't really screw up um, at this point. They've done enough to solidify their, their status. That's how I feel about them. I, um, I agree. It's a band that you forever have to pay your respects to because they uh, they changed metal. They yeah, it brought it to a commercial level where now this is a way now people can do metal bands for a living and a career. Mm-hmm. It literally opened the door for for heavy metal. Yeah, no doubt. I was um, bummed. Uh, I was bummed that they. I had never, I've never seen them before, and they were going to play a bunch of the f- uh, festivals this summer that we were going to kind of cover, and more specifically the one here, Rockville, uh, or in Daytona. So I was bummed that I won't be able to see them or Rage Against the Machine this year. Those two I was really looking forward to this year. Yeah, there's some sore ones for me. Uh, I don't want to, it's like reading an epitaph right now. I don't even want to get <laughs> into all the canceled stuff, but yeah. I was looking forward to Furnace Fest this year. That got oh, me real yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it is people. rescheduled. They, I think. Right. It, I think it just moved. Hopefully, Ann can still do it. I think. It's yeah, it's May uh, it's May 2021, and I think they, you know, I didn't speak to anybody at the Furnace Fest camp, but they said the majority, uh, you know, or, or a large portion of the the acts have reconfirmed for 2021 without 
you know, naming names. So hopefully the, 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 the core of the lineup, the, you know, the part that the nostalgic part and the sort of current part, all the, the important pieces are there. Uh, and I, I suspect they will be, but yeah, that, that one was a bummer because all these other fests are kind of like, I mean, whatever, they have good bands and some bands, you know, you don't get to see too often, but for the most part, they're every year and there's like 10 fests that are pretty much the same, uh, sure. you know, 80% of the same damn bands. And you yeah, know, you there's don't always, care there's that there's always much. the fest where I'm like, okay, I'll sit through these bands and we'll get, I'm going to get lunch here. And then I get to see the band I want to see. And then we'll probably, maybe we'll go look at merch and then I'll cut, kill an hour and I could come back. But that one had me, that one had me. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, was right absolutely. up my alley. There was a lot of stuff where I'm like, well, this is going to be a day. I'm going to have a fun yeah. day here. Yeah. You but might, you might cool. actually miss some Everything bands you want to see. You know. Sorry, Dave, you were saying? <laughs> I was like, you might even miss some bands you wanted to see. Yeah. 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 Um, those That's a uh, where they play at the same time and you got to catch five minutes of one and you run over, you waste half of a set just commuting from stage B to stage C, you know, I miss it. We got to have, we got to get shows back. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of which, I mean, I think you've been more than generous with your time. Uh, you've got a lot going on. I know you said you've got more planning to do for your charity event. So I don't want to, I could shoot the shit probably with you for a long time, um, but I don't want to tie you up anymore. Uh, so, Dave, unless you had something important, I say we let this dude go do uh, do uh, some great stuff for the community. Yeah, we uh, there's always an, another episode after everything has kind of settled down, and maybe you know maybe bands are playing again. Maybe we can do it in person, or you know, obviously with the Skype thing is a it's doable too. But uh, yeah, so thanks for you know reaching out and th or i think i might have tweeted you or something like that but thank you for responding in general and thanks for your time this evening uh will it's been it's been great man and again congrats on the record i i, I know we only have it's only been out like four days or so but uh i i suspect it'll be a very good record and a very good year for your band uh going forward you know if the every time i die album doesn't come out you may be in the running for some top album you know uh charts That's true. It, so that, that, that's I, I a silver hope it comes out and kicks my ass. <laughs> Let's say that, but yeah, there's a few in the pipeline. I'm excited about returning to normal, but we got a bigger issue first before we get to go have fun at shows again. Anyway, so I'm gonna work on that this week. I hope everybody else does continue to support the black community right now and uh, shut up if you're white and listen, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I've learned very quickly. We need to maybe start doing a little bit and. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this weekend. I really am. I think um, if anybody wants to get involved, just hit me up. I'm on all social shit, and I can get I can be reached. You know, any time of the day. I'm just gonna be working on this. I'd love to get more people involved, do more giveaways, try to raise more money. So it's so like it's still an open invitation out there, and love to sh hear some story, more stories from this community about what I could do to make this good. Give me some suggestions. I don't. I don't mind. I'm not an expert here. I'm just trying to do what I can with the people I know. Very awesome. commendable. Well, we wish you luck. Uh, I'll be tuning in. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. And thanks cool. again, man. Appreciate yeah, thank you for uh, giving me a minute to chat about it. And then let's talk later. Maybe we can do some. Let's go have fun. Let's do a fun one some other time. Yeah, we'll, do a, things we'll yeah. do a big fun one. Mm -hmm. I'd love to pick your brain on some engineering and production of some albums but yeah we'll we'll have to meet up again but thanks right. will appreciate it guys thank you